Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Domas. Uh, I've been a serial e-commerce entrepreneur, uh, and now I build a SaaS business to manage, automate, and grow commerce businesses in a single source of truth. Uh, the problem we are solving is that e-commerce SMBs manage each channel uh, separately, and they're unable to scale efficiently. So most of the processes that happen in the back office in, of e-commerce can definitely be streamlined and automated, uh, we can reduce the amount of human resources required because those are expensive and decrease every seller's profitability margin. And there is also a lack of interconnectivity between those processes. A solution multi-orders came up with is integrating all of those back office processes into a single platform that allows us to fulfill orders 10 times faster. Uh, our data is now synchronized across the, all of those channels. And there's various useful features such as listing products to marketplaces, shipping orders, syncing inventory, and resupplying in just a few clicks. Um, so this is our value proposition. It basically narrows down the areas we save that time upon. And whilst uh, a business without multi-orders can ship 0 0.33 orders, a business with multi-orders can do 3.33 orders. So everybody probably knows about e-commerce market. It's booming. I, I will not extend myself on that. Um, our customer ICPs are businesses that do at least 100K yearly turnover, uh, that do at least 100 daily orders, and that sell on at least two sales channels so we can synchronize them. So our mission is to help e-commerce businesses focus on their growth while spending way less time in their back office operations. Our vision is to become the only operations management platform that those sellers might need. So this is a showcase of how the product works. Uh, basically, we import all of the sales channels into the system. Uh, the system passes along the necessary order information into uh, the required warehouse, either it would be in US or Europe. That warehouse immediately gets a shipping label printed. I haven't laid down a single uh, finger on a button. Uh, meanwhile, the inventory gets synced into those channels and I can also list new products from my warehouse. Uh, our dashboard, um, in theory, it looks like this. It gives you useful information about businesses, the channels that are performing best, the products that are selling best in the ETC. Uh, our order dashboard, where I can ship in bulk, assign team members, leave notes, ship orders. I can also manage my Amazon MCF or FBA. And our inventory dashboard, where if I merge a single product through those channels, if it gets purchased on one channel, multi-orders lets each other channel know uh, that we must reduce a single stock. So the data we import uh, is quite significant. Then we can do a data-driven decisions about demand and supply for those products. We can then offer our subscribers uh, basically what they need to sell in, in order to basically gain more profitability, more revenues, and whatnot. Our go-to market is pretty easy. We aim at e-commerce sellers of all sizes. Um, why we do it? Because high-growth brands desperately need help. Uh, if they start accumulating orders, in the background is just a chaos. We're gonna do that through automation, synchronization, and aggregation. Uh, we're starting with EU and North America because of uh, the integrations we have, and we're doing it right now, of course, uh, because of why wait. Our revenue model is a SaaS B2B model. We charge businesses according to their business size. Uh, our current day performance is we have done over 300K in revenue. Our subscriber churn rate has fallen below 5%. Uh, our today's MRR is 23k MRR in euros. We have over 280 active subscribers. Uh, our competitors usually use management suits such as ShipStation, which helps with shipping, Sellbrite that helps with listing, and TradeGecko that helps with inventory. We want to do basically a standardized system that instead of using three different ones, uh, your time use... is up, Demantas. Uh, judges, feel free to ask your questions now. Um, sure, maybe I can I can go first. Um, firstly, really great project, uh, Demantas, and really great traction so far. Uh, I'd be very proud of you guys and, and the team. Um, a quick question I had is, uh, obviously, the e-commerce space is a very, very busy and competitive space. And I know you mentioned a few of your competitors, and you said that you know they focus on specific verticals. Is there anyone who is doing something close to what you guys are doing, i.e. joining these different verticals in one kind of platform, similar to what, how you guys are doing it? Sure. So some com some competitors might focus on, on basically might have a little spice of automation for a single vertical. However, no one is, is considering 
kind of covering the whole back office and, and, and aiming to basically create a single software for the, for the thing. Um, so we haven't yet found a single competitor that is, is, is in kind of our area of, of uh, our space. And, and why do you think that is? Uh, well, initially, uh, there's there's a lot you know going on. Once once you do go through investment rounds, you get quite advice, and there's a lot of people who say basically focus on one small thing, and and uh, we have always denied it, and and I think it shows uh, that that gladly we did because I personally have used ShipStation, I personally have used TradeGecko uh, before. Once I I did run these e-commerce business businesses. And it wasn't yet sufficient enough for me. I want to achieve, you know, an automated back office. Once, like Teslas get built by manufacturing arms, so should uh, so should an e-commerce back office be there. Okay, thanks. I'll pass to the rest of the judges. Maybe I'll go next. So, how do you deal with the kind of warehouses? You're not running warehouses, right? So, it's up to the to the clients to decide where to store and where to ship from. Yeah, so today we don't have yet 3PLs connected to the marketplace. However, if 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 an e-commerce seller runs his own warehouse or multiple warehouses, he can use us as a as a kind of inventorization platform both for for a warehouse. Um, if if it it would be a warehouse with you know um, I don't know 50 plus brands, yes, our system would not yet be sufficient for that. However, if, if I run a single brand and I have three warehouses in UK, US, and, and for example, in Asia somewhere, uh, multi-orders basically knows uh, from where the customer ordered and which warehouse should this order should be passed along to. Okay. Uh, maybe another question from my side. Could you speak a little bit about your team and what experience and background you guys have? Yeah, so we have three founders, uh, myself, um, kind of the visionary or, and an e-commerce kind of guy who, who had this problem and, and, and wanted to develop something like that. Uh, my fellow founder, Georgi, who has been through many various companies, corporate startups and, and kind of um, absorbed in for, uh, operations kind of uh, flow and structure. So he helps out with operations. And we have our CTO who, who's built over, I guess, 100 storefronts for e-commerce, uh, built a couple uh, high availability um, software such as VPN providers, and has now joined up with multi-orders. And in terms of attraction, how did you guys go about onboarding your first customers? And how do you, you know, what are your marketing channels that you're currently using to onboard these customers? Yeah, so three main channels currently are SEO, software directories, and app stores, such as in Shopify and Wix and BigCommerce, uh, and, and yeah, through our integration app store. So three main channels we, we currently use. Make, makes sense. And then what is your product vision for the next, say, five to 10 years? Yeah, so uh, as mentioned, uh, to create a kind of fully autonomous back office system. Um, so I kind of, with, with the right setup, uh, giving some time initially, uh, the, the system itself would know where to pass the correct information along. So it kind of would be a, a very smooth ride. Either I'd grow a thousand percent in a month or uh, any type. It's, it's just basically uh, give the system to, you know, digest uh, all of this uh, flow. Kind of. So just to become a fully autonomous back office system is, is the vision for five to 10 years. Makes sense. Um, and in terms of the consolidation of e-commerce, um, I know there's still opportunity for individual stores, but obviously Amazon is eating e-commerce. Do you think that is a, is a big threat to you guys? Do you think that's a shrinking market? Or do you think that there still is a growing market here? Uh, I personally think that Amazon will will not be able to eat up the whole market. There's a new guys such as Etsy popping up and, and growing way, way faster than uh, Amazon. And I think it will continue because uh, there's just so more, so much more uniqueness coming into e-commerce, such as products, you know, handmade products, or or like um, so much new competition coming along, and and new sellers when they enter into Amazon, uh, all I hear is disadvantages there. So I think it's just gonna uh, spread out and and be more than just Amazon. M makes sense, but just um, maybe just a follow on from that. If you see other players, such as even Shopify, for example, do you think if you guys start to see success, other more larger players may start to eat out of your own market share and create their own uh, all-in-one platforms to integrate everyone? Uh, yeah, uh, also have my doubts on that because then they would be in, in one way promoting their competitors, you know, kind of sell on all your sell on all channels that are available. 
Um, I, I bet they will do something like that for their channel. It's kind of their admin panel, their admin dashboard. And, and if you go into Amazon, there's various different features in, internally. But to have interconnectivity between different sales channels, I think it goes against their their you know um, their mission, kind of. Amazing. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, your time is up. Great presentation. Great questions from judges. I'm sure you can catch up later. So up next is James from Tend. Great. Hi, uh, I'm James. I'm the founder of Tend, and we're building the food system of the future. Uh, one sec, sorry. So the way we buy food is broken. Uh, this 200 billion pound industry is damaging in so many ways. Only 8% of the already low retail prices goes back to the farmer, meaning they're forced to cut costs in a way that degrades the environment in order to barely scrape a living. On top of that, consumers have an awful shopping experience. Going to the supermarket is such a chore. You're buying food that uh, was harvested eight days ago, so it's no longer fresh. And there's a complete lack of transparency into where our food comes from, how it's been grown, and the impact that that has. When I realized all this, I realized that my habit of going to Sainsbury's or Tesco's just didn't align with the values that I wanted to live by, and that what we needed to do it was go back to buying straight from the farmer, but that there was no easy or convenient way to do that. So I set up ten. We're rebuilding the food system for a digital world. We're not digitizing the supermarkets, but fundamentally redesigning the supply chain. We no longer need supermarkets to aggregate supply for us when farmers can sell their entire harvest on Tend. So Tend is a social commerce marketplace enabling any farmer to sell direct to any consumer. We're building a world where you can get fresh seasonal food delivered to your door from any farm in the UK within 36 hours of harvest a world where the farmers that feed us are supported and get a fair price for their products, and a world where grocery shopping is a fun and engaging activity that reflects the inherently social nature of food. We make it really easy for farmers to sell direct to consumers. All they have to do is upload what they have available and set their prices on, the, on our marketplace, and then customers can pick and choose what they want from their favorite farms, finding everything all in one place and have it all delivered in one go. We then provide the end-to-end -end logistics underlying this to make it really easy for both sides. All farmers have to do is harvest what was ordered, put it in the insulated cool boxes that we provide, and then our partner couriers pick this up and deliver it overnight to our microprocessing hubs, which are at a neighborhood level, and things like shipping containers in car parks and other underutilized assets, getting the food as close to last mile as possible, uh, where we then uh, combine those different customer orders and process them, combining the apples from one farm with the onions from another, and then finally delivering, delivering that last mile. We're putting the human relationships back into buying food, making grocery shopping the equivalent of the wonder of going to a farmer's market versus the chore of going to the supermarket. Farmers can interact with their customers, telling their stories through uh, social content such as photos, videos and live streams, uh, whether they've just quit their job and started farming or they're a fifth generation family farm. They're able to bring their customers along for the journey with them. We're also bringing in influencer chefs who are there recommending specific products and recipes, saying, uh, for example, I absolutely love the beef from Wilden Meadows. It's grass fed and so buttery. And here's my recipe for uh, lasagna. And finally, enabling people to share food with friends. For example, they might go, Veronica, I know you absolutely love tomatoes. Uh, you know, check out these tomatoes from Sutton Community Farm. They're so juicy and tender. I absolutely love them. And if we buy them together in a group purchase, we can uh, get a discount uh, across the order and you can invite your friends as well. And it's this part that customers really love about us. They really love the connection and community that Ten brings. They're not just buying food. They're buying into that, uh, that kind of community aspect and um, you know, knowing that they're supporting uh, Farmer Joe rather than a big corporation. Since launching our proof of concept, we've delivered over 300 orders to more than 100 customers. We've been uh, doing just under £2,000 worth of GMV a month, and over the last quarter, over 80% of our GMV has come from repeat customers. We've got 24 farmers in the pipeline, uh, in, 24 farmers on the marketplace, sorry, and another 10 to 15 in the pipeline. We've now hit operational capacity and are raising a £300,000 pre-seed round in order to expand. We've got £80,000 of this committed and our advanced assurance uh, for SEIS and EIS. Uh, yeah, so we're using this funding to build out the operations and lay the foundation uh, and look forward to can, chatting to you about it. Free to ask any questions. Yeah, maybe we can start. Um, so the, the food delivery market is obviously uh, quite crowded space, right? 
I'm thinking, for example, even Cortilia, that raised 40 million in a few months ago, there's quite a, kind of like trying to tackle the same market, more or less, right? C getting product from the farmers straight away to the customers. Um, so this is the first question is, uh, how do you, would you describe your USP? And second, how do you make sure to ensure uh, quality across the, the different uh, producers, right? To, to the final product you deliver to the customers. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, obviously this is this is uh, a lot of interest in this space at the moment, but I think a lot of the people raising funding at the moment are um, kind of digitizing the existing solutions um, rather than actually fundamentally rethinking how we uh, do the supply chain and enabling people to go straight from the farm. Um, yeah, within that, our USP is this, um, the connection and community that we bring, the fact that you can see life on the farm and understand, see the farmer behind it and know that you are supporting Farmer Joe, uh, people really love that. And then also our lower cost of logistics by having these micro hubs enable us to do that in a cheaper way. Over time, our then defensibility moves towards the network effects that come from a marketplace. Um, you know, more supply enables more selection, enables more demand, uh, and that flywheel effect goes on. Uh, in terms of quality, uh, so yeah, we, we uh, initially are working with all the farms that we, we work with. We have a phone call with them and understand how they farm. We've done a few farm visits as well, uh, just to sort of make sure like everything's um, yeah, up to standard in terms of how we uh, you know, want our farmers to work. Um, now, over time, that will move in towards a more trust-based model with kind of ratings and things like that. If someone doesn't get a good product, then you know, there will be reviews that that kind of reflect that in the webs uh, on the marketplace, and so customers will be able to see it there. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? How do you plan to? Go ahead. Sorry, please go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, my question was on team. Um, what makes your team the, the the right team to execute this idea? Yeah, absolutely. So the team at the moment um, <clears throat> is me as, as a, a kind of as the solo founder. Um, the, the, what kind of makes us this me the right team to execute is um, well, you know, I've done it so far and I've built it to this level. Level. I'm planning on bringing in an operations lead and a technical lead who will bring in those other aspects of the team to help develop the product and lay the operational foundation. Um, you know, I've got a background. I studied um, you know, ecology and conservation at Cambridge University. I've got published research into biodiversity. So this is a space that I know well and I'm very passionate about. Uh, and then I've got um, you know, experience running you know, st strategy and operations as a consultant and then um, did a study for an MBA at Wharton Business School. So I've got kind of the operational side of things as well. Great. Um, just one bit of feedback would be um, uh, in your pitch, just a, a slide on kind of what you're looking for next. I mean, it sounds like you could do most of the stuff yourself, but um, uh, I, I think that would be something important because um, whenever I look at companies um, to invest in, I always think about okay, well, what what is the what's the team the founder has got around them, um, and how are they going to kind of move from this vision into something which can which can really scale quite quickly. Sure, thank you. Hey James, really good pitch, and uh, really like the vision as well. I mean, we definitely need more sustainable food. The food is for you. We're trying to solve that problem. Um, lucky for you, or maybe I'll say unlucky, is that my previous start, I was actually trying to solve a very similar problem, uh, albeit with dry commodities and in Africa. Um, so a few questions that I have for what you're building. Um, the first is that, I mean, besides competition, we all know that this industry really is about price. As much as consumers like to glorify that everyone likes to eat sustainably, they're not willing to pay for it. Um, so how do you manage to keep your unit economics positive in such a low margin industry? Yeah, so you know, the reason it's so low margin is because there's so many hands you know, taking that food. So you know, back at the start, I talked about how there's 8% of the retail price goes to it, the actual end farmer. And so that gives us a lot of um, margin to play with to actually give them a better price and the consumers a better price by enabling people to go direct. Um, you know, our current business model is we take 30% uh, of the retail price. Um, and then on that, we have 50% um, gross margins at scale. So doubling the gross margins um, or, or more of the supermarkets. And so it's that kind of lower cost uh, direct from the consumer using these micro hubs rather than big warehouses that enables that model. Uh, hey, James, uh, I'm sorry, your time is up now, but I'm sure you can catch up in the networking session. So yeah. up next, we have Freddy, um, Freddy from SQI. 
Hey, I'm Freddie, and I'm the founder of Ski. Ski, SQI, is a lifestyle winter fashion brand here to blur the lines between slopes, streets, and sports. We'll be launching with our iconic hoodie style wireless phone charging winter jackets made from recycled plastic bottles later this year in October. These jackets are waterproof, windproof, insulated, and stylish, designed to protect you from the elements when you're 3,000 meters up a mountain and optimized to make a real fashion statement here at home. Uh, and in urban cities around the world. The goal was to create a concise range with the environment front of mind. So we plan to release this jacket in four colorways, sand, forest, ocean, and volcanic. I had the idea for this product and for this brand three years ago when I was looking to buy a new jacket for a ski holiday. My thinking was, if I'm going to spend two or 300 pounds on a jacket, I want more than just a ski jacket. I want something that I can get a lot of use out of here at home in the UK through our winters. And I was really shocked at the lack of options out there. There was a clear opportunity for a brand who wanted to bridge the gap from piece to pavement with a hybrid product and a hybrid brand. Traditionally, the ski industry, fashion industry, and sports industries have remained very separate and distinct to each other. However, over the last 30 years, the lines between these industries have blurred as society evolves and consumer habits change. And now there is big overlap between these markets. And in fairness to some fashion and sports brands, they are to an extent aware of this. However, the ski industry is very late to the party. In fact, you could take it one step further and say that the ski industry as a whole hasn't seen a challenger or a disruptor yet at all. And this creates a really big opportunity for us. Our mission statement is simple, to reimagine the boundaries of a ski brand. And that's why we have our slopes, streets, sports mentality. I'm currently fundraising to launch Ski in October later this year. In total, we're raising £250,000. So far, we've raised £130,000. And what this, and what this 130000 allows us to do is to buy these four jackets. We place an order for 1,000 units in four weeks' time. And I'm here pitching to you today because we'd like to raise an additional 120000 to take us to that total target of 250 so we can do three more things as part of our launch. The first thing I'd like to do is purchase an order of loungewear, the products you see here, to complement the headline jackets. The joggers and sweatshirts are made from recycled cottons, whilst the tees are made from bamboo. The second thing I'd like to do is increase our content budget. As a fashion brand, it goes without saying that your product is really important. But what I think really matters and what will really create differentiation is brand, social media, content, digital marketing, creators and influencers. All in all, content is king. The third and final thing I'd like to do with your investment is some influencer marketing. I've been working with the team at Influencer who have offered us a guaranteed five to one return on advertising spend. Simply put, if we invest 50 grand with Influencer, this guarantees us 250 grand worth of sales. And I would love to go ahead with this should we be able to raise our full investment target of 250. When it comes to influencers and creators, it's worth quickly introducing the Ferdinand twins, Remy and Anya, who will be the face of our brand when we launch later this year. The girls are aspiring dancers, performers, content creators, and social media personalities. They don't yet have a huge following, unlike other members of their family, but we aren't partnering with them for their followers. We're partnering with the twins for the content that they can create with us this year. This slide here shows the core team of 10 people who will launch the brand with me later this year. Each person brings a different skill set to the table. And as a business, we're really well-rounded and ready to launch. There's so much more information I could share with you. Uh, nearly impossible to do this brand justice in just four minutes. I thought it was five, so I might go slightly over. We have a team video available where everyone's shown on hey, this Freddy, slide. Here, your time is up now. Feel free to finish, I'll up. finish off. I'll be 30 seconds and I'll be done. Um, so yeah, we have a full team video available where all 10 of us introduce ourselves. Uh, all of these finance documents, a cash flow forecast, balance sheets, profit and loss, full unit economics, that's all ready to go. And the last slide to finish on is our Land Rover Defender that we're looking forward to using later this year as the UK and Europe starts to leave the era of lockdowns behind as the travel boom and the roaring 20s begin. At Prey Ski, events and entertainment, and entertainment are a huge part of what makes a ski holiday so fun. And we intend to bring the Apre ski culture from peace to pavement from Mary Bell to London. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. More than happy to now answer your questions. Well done. Uh, so yeah. how will the, the jackets compare to, to what we usually buy in kind of uh, 
a ski store. So kind of in terms of uh, wind breaking, uh, waterproof, etc. Yeah, so it has all of those things in spades. Uh, it's designed to protect you in horrible weather when you're at the top of a mountain. So it's waterproof, windproof, insulated and everything. Um, and I think a lot of people really trust ski jackets because if they're buying a ski jacket, they know it's going to keep you warm, dry uh, and protected from the weather. And so I think we kind of inherently have this um, kind of built into our brand and built into our product by, by playing on our on our ties to the ski industry. If you want particular numbers, it's 10K, 10K. Five. No, 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 that, that, that's fine. No, sorry. Yes. Cool. No, that's all good. No, really good pitch, Freddie. I think it was one of the more engaging ones, which uh, I really appreciate because you kind of can feel the passion coming out there. I think it's very important for a B2C brand especially. Um, so really good job yeah. on that. Um, well, obviously, this market is, I think you kind of mentioned in your pitch as well, a lot of it comes down to um, a lifestyle and you want to sell that kind of lifestyle and people want to resonate with that lifestyle. Um, so you did mention a few yeah. of, you know, the what are the name? I forgot the name of the twins that you want to use. But why is kind of that yeah. longer term vision? A lot of times of these new brands coming out is very much the founder behind it that starts as an influencer and then he monetizes his community. How do you guys, since uh, you know you're, you're getting external people to do it, how do you guys plan to have that long term moat in terms of your influencer um, uh, yeah. branding? Yeah, good, good question. So I think long term for us, I mean, influencer marketing, firstly, is one of the things the ski industry just doesn't do very well. The influencers they choose to work with are professional athletes, so professional skiers and professional snowboarders. And they can create really engaging, really cool content. But on the whole, they have very small followings and the mass market do not follow skiers and snowboarders. They follow normal influencers, are mainstream influencers for what I call them for the purpose of this. And a lot of these influencers love to go skiing for one week a year. They love to take a ski holiday just for one week. And there is currently no fashion brand or ski brand that works with this influencer. And as far as I'm concerned, I think this is the bigger ski market. I think the majority of people, particularly here in the UK that go skiing, tend to only go for one week a year, one week every two years. And the influencer that shares this trait, they don't, there's no brand that represents them right now. So I think there's actually a really big, um, I want to say niche, but I think it's a lot bigger than a niche. So I think there's a really big opportunity um, for a brand to step into this space of the influencer scene. Um, and influencer marketing is the place to be these days. It's word of mouth redefined. Um, it's the number one way to scale uh, and and build an identity as a fashion brand. I think that's very compelling. That sounds makes a lot of sense. Have you guys thought of doing a crowdfunding round? Yeah, we have. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of penciling that in for 18 months time at our next round. Um, at this stage, you know, we're pre-revenue and we're launching in October later this year. Um, and I'm quite keen, to be honest, based off the back of the success we've had so far fundraising, I'm quite keen to just keep it private. You know, I kind of don't see the need at the moment to take it to crowdfund um, because the next 12 months is all about just proving our concept, you know, gaining some traction, proving that our product is up to scratch, which I know it is, but we need customers to see it and we need investors to see it. And so that's what we want to do over the next 12 months. And I think presuming we do that well, I think doors will open up to us for, for routes such as crowdfunding, because I, I completely agree. I think it would make a lot of sense for us to do that. Um, I think there'll be, uh, yeah, we're a community brand, absolutely. And it's a big world. Amazing. Where, where are you going to manufacture uh, the jackets and everything? Yeah, so we, we're, we're partnered with a family run factory in Shanghai to manufacture the jackets at the moment. Uh, long term, we'd look to acquire our own factory where we have total control, control over the entire process. Um, we have full control over what fabrics we use at the moment. So in terms of our materials, we are really sustainable um, and, and because of our relationship with the family run factory, we know they have very good standards and we'll be creating a video uh, when we launch later this year to show exactly how our jackets are made. And so on the packaging, there'll be a QR code when a customer opens the box and it will say, scan this QR code to see how your jacket is made. And we will literally show customers how our jacket is made because we don't have anything to hide. And I think more brands need to be like this. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you, Freddy. Your time is up. Great Most presentation welcome. and great questions from judges. Thanks so a lot. up next, we have Stefan from BridgeX. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I um, appreciate the opportunity. Great to meet you all, even if somewhat um, virtually. So um, let me talk a little bit about, about BridgeX. What we're really about, this is a, I want to just, uh, before we get into too much detail, we really just cover off some some base points to, I guess, to try and help um, uh, kind of put this in, in the right box. So 
Uh, Bridgex's vision is really to revolutionize, revolutionize the way that organizations commercially operate. Um, for, for reasons I'll go into, I think the way that it's done today is, is arcane and we're, we're looking to make a, a, a transformational change in that regard, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a little minute. We're a B2B uh, platform. Um, we're, we're SaaS, UK-based, launched uh, last year. We have our first customers, but we're pre-revenue. Um, we're seeking, it says here, up to a million and up to up to 20% um, of the business. The, the rest you can see for yourself. Um, I think at this point in time, it's fair to say, whilst we are looking for money, actually, we, we don't particularly need it at this point in time. What I'm more interested in doing is finding the right relationships with the right investors that um, understand the thesis that we're investing against and are prepared to be with us on, on, a, on a longer term journey. So what, what problem are we fixing? So um, as I just said, I think the current processes are somewhat arcane. Uh, arcane. The, the way that contracts have been done for the last, you know, however long is, you know, they're, they're signed on a piece of paper filed and typically in substandard uh, storage. You know, most of the organizations we go into, particularly smaller and mid-sized businesses are using, you know, SharePoint or Dropbox to, to store a copy of a contract once, once it's been signed. Um, and all that information is then locked within the document. And it's very difficult for organizations to be able to track uh, what happens during the life of that contract, because all the information necessary is scattered across the number of systems we've spent the last 30 years deploying in order to automate different process customers in the front office and the middle office and the back office. So we've got this huge information fragmentation problem uh, that, that sits alongside it. The consequences of this are significant, both in the front, middle and back office. Um, we, go, we go in and talk time after time to customers and, and without wanting to be sort of too pointed and accusatory. So, well, you know, as we sit here today, you know, it, how many clients are you dealing with? What stage are your engagements with them? Have you been paid? You know, are you on, on track? Um, which clients, which products, which sectors? And, and that's information which they struggle to, to answer. They can typically answer it, uh, you know, 10 days later or, or a few days later once they've typically sent off a junior member of team with a spreadsheet to go and scrape data out of uh, current systems. But they certainly don't have that um, that information at their fingertips. And, and in today's world, the, the pace that things are moving, we think that's, in fact, we know that's a, that's a problem. And it ultimately leads to the whole team, uh, you know, kind of flying blind. So we're, we're here to, to fix that problem all the way through from what we call from handshake to outcome. Um, and that really comes and brings two or three different benefits to the end consumer or the end customer. The first is some peace of mind, uh, knowing that all of their important contract, contractual information is in one place and under control, uh, that they get transparency of what happens through the life uh, of a particular engagement as it uh, pertains to the obligations and uh, you know everything that they've signed up to. And also um, then bringing efficiencies in terms of reduced time uh, and reduced friction in the process uh, through what you might call the commercial operations process. Uh, how do we sit alongside existing systems? Oh, we're not there to replace them. What we are there to do uh, is to provide this comops layer, this commercial operations layer um, that is the authoritative source of what's been agreed um, and then interfaces with those other key systems that I'd said have been deployed over the last 30 years in order to extract the key information necessary to bring, um, as it were, as it, as it would to a bridge in a, in a ship or a vessel, uh, to bring the CEO and their team uh, the key information that they need in order to um, you know, manage, uh, uh, manage their obligations in, in real time. Uh, what have we built? We've built what we've built so far. We're building for scale. We know from all the organizations we've talked to, literally every Please business Stephane, we go in says, Your time is up now. Please finish up and keep in mind you're using your feedback time from now on. Thank you. Appreciate the appreciate the shout. So we've we've built for scale. Um and um you know, we, we're building a product that we expect to be able to um, suit hundreds of thousands of customers. It's very front end heavy in terms of capital. Uh, we've been building for two years, just rolling out to first customers. Um, once we've done that, we'll be relying on uh, delivery partners uh, in order to create scale uh, in the coming years. Um, and uh, I think probably that at this point, I'll then stop. I won't eat any more into my feedback time. Um, I'll hand over for questions and feedback and we can go from there. I can answer any questions that come up. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions. Uh, really nice to meet you, Stephen. Um, yeah, you too. Uh, my question was just around uh, the feedback from your customers so far. You mentioned you've got a couple of people using this already. What kind of difference has this made to their business operations and what problems is the product encountering at the moment? 
so the first of those two, I think um, the, the biggest piece of feedback is this twofold, really. One is uh, the, uh, the peace of mind, just knowing that all of their important commercial contract information is, isn't in Dropbox or SharePoint. It, it is in um, a location that's uh, designed uh, to, uh, to manage that information. Um, they've got the peace of mind knowing that from a, a kind of an alerts and notifications point of view that they'll get automatically alerted 30 days or 60 days before a contract is up, whereas at the moment they tend to just, um, you know, miss those renewal dates or find themselves on the back foot in a negotiation with a renewal um, because they didn't have enough time to, to plan. Um, and then because we include digital signing in the product, then people are either saving money because they're managing to ditch their um, digital, their standalone digital signature solution um, or they don't have one and they're reporting, you know, improved benefits in terms of customer experience because um, using a digital signing product, particularly post pandemic, is just, you know, giving their customers a better experience and taking, you know, 30 to 50 percent out of their commercial execution, um, you know, time periods and costs. Um, challenges in the product right now, um, actually, I think as we as we as we scale up, um, we're, we're doing some work to collaborate with the World Contract and Commerce, uh, Commerce and Contracting Organization um, on some data standards. I think not for today, but much further down the line. Um, one of the things that's really, I think, absent globally um, are some decent standards for the way that contracts are commercially structured. Um, into you know, and having some XML and JSON schemas available for automating. Um, you know, there's a lot of work going on to automate and try and standardize legal clauses, but not very much going on around the transportation and it, of, of commercial information as it's exchanged between parties. And so um, I think one of our challenges coming up in the coming years will be making sure that we can get organizations to adopt some common data standards in order to help them improve their own efficiencies, I would say. Um, but at this point in time, the product's been out with customers for six months. It's robust. It's stable. Uh, with, we're onboarding a new customer a week at the moment. I'm more interested in getting them on board and getting feedback than taking revenue from them at this point in time. Um, but that's what we're doing. Isn't, isn't what, you're, what you're trying to achieve also being the, the great promise of smart contracts that they will automate all these uh, kind of relationships where the events happen, then automatically the code will trigger some consequences, et cetera, et cetera, in a kind of very transparent way. So uh, yeah. kind of the buzz has subsided significantly, but uh, it seems that you're trying to solve the same problem. So how do you measure again this? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And actually it was one of my points of inspiration when I started this, you know, I, I, I worked in consulting for, for 30, you know, for 20 years with KPMG and Accenture. And I saw this inefficiency problem when I saw the smart contracts thing come up, particularly through Ethereum. Um, you know, I looked at that and I kind of went, actually, that that's the right answer. But the but it's a too low a level from a commercial point of view. So if you take that um, need for autonomy and automation and you scale it up, um, and look at it not necessarily at a more technical layer, but at a commercial layer, then that's very much how we've built the, the, the platform. Um, so each deal has its own, each contract has its own API endpoint um, and has a degree of autonomy so that it can be um, acting more like an active responsive item rather than, um, you know, rather than something that's, that's dead and we've architected that way. We do use blockchain for notarizing um, so that we're able to establish an audit trail of the the history of of uh, uncertainty of contract information. Um, but yeah, we're taking we've taken quite a lot of inspiration from the smart contract world and just applied that similar sort of autonomy thinking um, at a commercial relationship level. If that makes sense, we've we've rolled it up several layers within the organisation. Sorry to interrupt you, Stefan. Your time is up now. Thank you. Great presentation and great Thank questions you. from the judges. And I'm sure you can catch up later. So up next, Pleasure. we have Ross from AQAI. Hi, everybody, and great to be here. So many of you have heard of IQ. That's our cognitive intelligence. Some might have heard of your EQ. Over the last 20, 30 years, our emotional intelligence has been a big factor for success. But I'm going to tell you now, it's our AQ that is the most important skill for the future. So very simply, we're raising a $2 million seed round. The sector is AI, health tech, and ed tech. And what we're doing is transforming the health and well being of 100 million people. So, what's going on and what's happening? We are living in exponential times where the pace of change is accelerating so quickly. So, all of these converging 
compounding exponential technologies are growing at a rate where our human adaptability can't keep up. So what we're seeing is a risk of many organizations and people and teams suffering and risk of collapse. And how do we train and plan for jobs that we don't even know what they are yet? Uh, Reskilling is a massive opportunity. So a small survey shows 375 million people needing to switch occupations and reskill. And if you think about that number, that's the whole working population of the USA, Canada, Japan, Australia, and UK combined. So it's a big challenge of how do people adapt. In fact, it's the number one in-demand skill when you look at countless different surveys and reports from World Economic Forum to this one in terms of LinkedIn, of our resilience and adaptability being number one. And this isn't just a COVID impact. That's just accelerated the future of work. So what we do at AQAI is we measure adaptability scientifically and robustly across 15 different dimensions. And then we've got a scalable way to how do you improve it? So this is not something that just puts you in a box with a label. It's then a program to how do I improve my resilience, my grit, my team support, all of these different factors. So we have a patent pending on our model, AQ. Uh, we have trademarks around it and we've got the assessment up and running. Um, you get an independent individual dashboard report. It's done in a very interesting way. So it's done via an AI conversation in a chatbot, and then you get that instant report. We also are now certifying and training coaches. That's our go to market is through coaches and consultants whilst we're building up an AI digital coach. So Ada, instead of learning and going to an event that is then the knowledge that you have to remember to think when you're using it. Coaching needs to be in line with life when you need it. it, needs to understand how you learn, when you learn and your adaptability so that it can be very personal. What It's what happens at exec level, but not for many who are being left behind through this big change. Business model is simple. Three areas are assessment through the channel based on volume and channel is the price points for the individuals. The coaching platform in, that is a subscription based to ADA and also the marketplace of all the consultants that we're training, and then our licensing that we are doing for these coaches. In fact, in the last four months, we've certified and trained 66 coaches, and we're onboarding about another 20 every month. So we believe everyone deserves access to the best minds and coaches in training, regardless of their location or wealth in their career. Um, we've raised about a million dollars to date, We've got lots of great clients who are paying already, users across 52 different countries and distribution partners in a range of countries as well. Uh, so I'm going to pause there and go straight into feedback and questions. Hey, Ross. Uh, great presentation and very, very clear. I really understood it from what you're explaining. So good on you for that. Um, I suppose the question is, I still don't fully understand exactly what you guys have, you know, what's the solution that you're offering? Is it a way of um, the mindset that I'm in, in terms of adaptability of education? What exactly is your offering? So what we're offering is the insights to understand and measure adaptability. So we do that across these 15 different dimensions in a scientifically validated way. So a, an employee would take the assessment, they'll get their individual report, but then from a company basis, they get an aggregated team view. And we start to do predictive analysis of reskill index and change readiness. Uh, so this is working inside HR departments, innovation, mergers and acquisitions. For example, GSK, we're putting 500 of their executive leadership th team through. Uh, we've got coaches working with Microsoft employees that are going through change. So we give the data and then we give training on how to improve those dimensions. Makes a lot of sense. I suppose, I mean, the change management industry is definitely a very big industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose a question comes in terms of the actual employees who are receiving this information, especially when it comes from an HR department. Sometimes it feels a bit intrusive. Sometimes it feels like it's just another task they want employees to do. How do you get over that barrier of just making it kind of work for employees? A couple of pieces. There is a survey fatigue, um, you know, employees being over surveyed. That's why it's done via a conversational chatbot. The feedback we've had from be it UN agencies to IBM is that this feels like nothing they've experienced before to gain that data and insight. In fact, we're getting more authentic uh, insights than through even a human doing it. And that's proven from some DARPA studies and things like that. So one aspect is the user experience of it. The other is the context and also the protection. So the user themselves 
are in control of their data and can make it visible or not to the company. The company sees it uh, anonymized and aggregated to be able to do team activities, uh, whereas the individual can take their own responsibility for their own you know, career portfolio and career path as they develop as well. So we've thought about it in those two ways. To give you context, uh, I've been an entrepreneur 20 years. I ran my own agency, brand agency for 18. I employed about 100 people over that period and did a successful exit in 2017. Uh, so I've got a lot of collaborations and partners, full-time team of six. Um, so, you know, it's still at early stages, but we've got some good traction so far. Amazing. Sounds really good. Thanks. So it's all good and well knowing what the problem is, say, on a team or how the team is feeling. But then how do you actually address that problem? Um, do you think organizations put resources into perhaps the assessment? Or do you think maybe they will rather, you know, put people through a, a reskilling workshop, for example, to learn a certain hard skill? So these um, are great Great question. These things are already happening. And in fact, soft skills are seen as more important than the hard skills during the transition and changes in you know, large employers. And um, the assessments is just the data and the Trojan horse in to then how do you support them through that process? So in terms of we're looking at the environment, workplace stress, anxiety, lots of input. And the they already need this and are coming to us. So, for example, Dell, uh, reached out to a university saying adaptability is one of our core pillars for the next two years. Can you help us? They said, go and speak to AQAI. They're the most credible in the space. So we've put down some very significant relationships where this is an issue. Reskilling, you know, transforming every organization, reimagining their business model. How do humans, how are they supported through that? How do you create the psychological safety in teams? That's the interventions that we're building in into the system, both through the marketplace and our Ada coach, which our Ada coach launches in about 60 days time. We've got some very significant partnerships that have been building out that AI and uh, and, and platform. So, um, yeah, it's just a very exciting time to be working on this. And we're doing it because we don't want to see people left behind. You know, it's all very well technology accelerating everything humans are an important part of that so how can we underpin them where their identity is so linked to their current job how do we support them through that to find new opportunities as they adapt to a new future of work amazing makes a lot of sense so thanks for that ross thanks Mohammed. thanks everybody perfect timing thank you ross thanks. and thank you judges for your questions so up next we have slavas from off school thanks so hey everyone i'm slavas from off school so let's get straight to it. Who are we and what is Offschool? So the Offschool is the free language learning app and it's a spin-off project of Soul Education. You know, we can talk forever on how learning languages is important. Unfortunately, learning a foreign language can be expensive, especially if you take a college course or pay for your private tutoring. So we asked ourselves, how can we make learning accessible to everyone? So allow me to present to you the Offschool. Le language learning app, always free, always interactive always live streaming lessons by professionals. So the beauty of off school is that students can study as long as they want with us. But if they require an official certificate, they will have to purchase it at a cost of just 19 pounds. The monetization structure will also include an in-app and streaming advertising, international test shop, and online merchandise shop. So how does the whole thing works? Our Competition analysis, we've realized that none of the largest providers of language learning apps are free, and neither of them are able to organize proper life lessons, nor give tangible results such as uh, certificates. And the off school here can. So let's ask ourselves, how can we here? So first of all, we have a network of 4,000 sales agents worldwide already, and within more than 130 countries. Our current potential reach is more than 1 billion 7 to 19 year olds. And more importantly, we have gathered the academic content for 45 years, which can be used immediately. Our projected revenues are 29 million pounds by 2023 with a net profit margin of 31% and a payback period of less than three years. Of schools post money valuation has been set to 5.3 million pounds by series.com and our targeted fund size is 5.1 million pounds with the first seed round targeted of 545,000 and partly by crowdfunding. We've just finished last week our successful crowdfunding campaign on seeders.com, uh, where we've raised 201k British pounds.
Uh, the success of this project is hardly, of course, possible without the team. And me as the head of this project with 20 years experience, including successful exits, Laurent Potier, uh, head of the agency in Belgium, will be developing our sales network. Uh, Christopher Ritalek, Cambridge University alumnus, can be a better suit for our academic development. Um, our lead investor and my partner, uh, my business partner, Adama Zedika, uh, the shareholder of Akemos Group. Uh, the best actually example of our network strength is the advisory board, uh, which consists of professionals from all over the world, and I'll be able to talk more about them if there are any questions. So that's actually it. And uh, so we believe we are transforming learning by making quality education accessible to millions. And we really invite all of you to join us on this journey. Maybe I can start. Um... Can you elaborate a little bit better on your business model? You mentioned a couple of right. streams coming out of your product. And right. second of all, uh, no, let's start with this and then I'll follow up later. All right. Uh, so if the, the business model is like such, we have lessons on a daily basis. If it's as simple as it is, uh, there are several levels and there are in the several languages. They are always live. They can be chosen, of course, on demand with all the progress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's kind of hard. it's a kind of complex, uh, complex question here. And then what we're doing whenever the kids or adults they require to purchase certificate which they require for the university and they can do it with us so they can purchase it by purchasing through their through their app we are accredited by abls our french school is accredited by delft in their uh, in france so every single language is accredited in their own countries and uh, with our certificates you can get into the school into their university etc etc and this is the main uh, when it comes to their the the, the main profit uh, the the main part of the business Uh, did I answer the question? Yeah. How many um, users do you have on the platform? And I guess because you're operating oh. on like a free model, what's the churn rate like? All right. So at the moment, because uh, the company which we have purchased with my uh, on the pre seed round, uh, we have purchased the UK based educational organization in order to create the program. So it's the idea stage at the moment. Uh, we are starting with the alpha version in June, the beta version in October. Uh, we're on the 75% already done the whole thing. Now we're producing their, uh, uh, the studios where the teachers are going to be shot, et cetera, et cetera. So now we don't have, but generally speaking, as the company, the one which, because it's a spin-off project, every single year, uh, South Education, and I was the CEO of this company for several years, uh, we are bringing more than 5,000 students to the UK, US, it's physically when I say so all from all over the world. So our reach at the moment, so our salespeople, we have more than 4,000 salespeople around the world. And we are sure that we are going to be able to bring the student to study free if we're able to bring 5,000 to the UK every single year. Yeah. Um, that's just me following on from that first question. Uh, I think myself or many other millions of other people around the world during COVID tried to learn a new language. Uh, and I tried yeah. a bunch of different platforms and uh, it was kind of sticking with it that really I just really cycled with. Um, how do you plan to be different to all these other platforms in terms of the actual learning? Are you guys better yeah. teaching a language? Uh, that's, yeah, this is, that, that's exactly, that's the best question I could have today. Uh, generally, all of the platforms, in, including the, you know, Duolingo, Memrise, Bubble, any, any uh, they're quite nice. Uh, the only thing that you can't reach higher than uh, B A to B1 level of CFR. So it's just like you can't be more than pre intermediate. So the main thing for us, generally, is that all the lessons are going to be live or on demand. We will have all the gaming part as well. But the main thing is the live lessons on a daily basis. So whenever you go to your app, you are planning, like in a, any you know, sport, uh, sport, sport app which you're doing, you are planning your week. You're having your lessons based on the time zone you are in. So we have the lessons from the US, from, from sorry, from the UK and Canada. And uh, we will be streaming the lessons from there and there. And uh, this is what I'm telling that there will always be life and you will be able to choose your level based on level and uh, age group as well. Thanks for answering that. Uh, I would say in your pitch deck, it was quite good. A lot of times you see people putting too much information in pitch deck, whereas yours is quite nice. Uh, I would say the two points you make, you have a slide where you have a, a bunch of numbers on there. 
um, yeah. quite a key slide. That's a slide that at least I look for on a pitch deck. And I would say yours is a bit all over the place. And I couldn't really understand what each number meant. If you make all right. that a bit clearer and, and ensure the numbers are quite well, I would say that would be a, a good improvement. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mohammed. And I think having something a, a little bit on kind of who your customer is would be would be kind of quite key, particularly as you're in kind of the idea stage at the moment, and just understanding the logic behind it. Um, I think through the questions, it was clear kind of how the spin-off links with kind of your parent company, yeah, um, yeah. but but it, but it wasn't clear initially. Yeah, that's that's what I've been requested by the investors not to put a lot about this uh, about their uh, the, the original company so we would not be talking about it and this is where we are always fighting you know whenever it comes to this point i understand you clearly i, I do agree with you this is what we wanted at the beginning and we were always starting this is who we are we're top five language schools in the world so being in the top five we know what we can do we know how many employees we have we know how many sales people we have and we can reach actually more than 90 percent of teachers of language uh, language teachers in Brazil. So we have more than 500 people in Brazil just going into the schools and we'll be able to say the teacher, please do the free lessons. Uh, we know that we can scale. We, we know, you know, that this is our biggest thing. Uh, none of their competitors have a real salespeople around the world, everything through online. We actually can, can interact with the academic institution. Sorry, Veronica. Thank you, Slav. Great page. Great Thank you very much. From judges. Um, so up next, okay. we have Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Robert from MyAI. I'm a serial entrepreneur and CEO of MyAI, which is a global tech startup with a vision for a new type of marketplace. You are extremely valuable. And just ask Google. The problem is you can't fully leverage this value online. If you could, you wouldn't spend days in pain trying to plan the next vacation online just to end up going to Rome again. Or you wouldn't waste countless nights filling out job applications just to be rejected by a computer algorithm every time. And you definitely wouldn't try lining up your next hot date in London on your own, especially after last week's disaster in Paris. Instead, you'd have other people do that work for you. Now to make that work for you, we needed to actually transform you into your own marketplace where you can easily manage, control and leverage your value. And don't worry if you're short on time for this marketplace to market yourself, we'll give you your own personal AI to act as your agent and gatekeeper so you can get offline and actually enjoy the rest of the world. So it's kind of a reverse marketplace in fact, where people come to you to compete for your services to, to compete for services and needs that you might like placing a downward pressure on prices and an upward pressure on quality so transforming you into your own marketplace where you can leverage the entirety of your value it will take some time so we're going to start addressing one frustration at a time and just like amazon we're starting with one vertical ripe for disruption and thanks in part to covid the ripest of them all is in fact travel so a, per, a certain paradox exists in this massive $9 trillion industry where travel agencies even generated a staggering 300 billion in revenue in 2020, a pandemic year. Problem is that travelers increasingly want this hyper-personalized experience, but also the convenience of booking online. And as we know, the two of these just don't go well together. On the other hand, those that are actually able to service and provide you that personalization for travel, travel agents cannot find you. They can't find a way to get their value in a convenient way online for you to access. So my A platform uses a special passion point design methodology to find not where you want to go, but what you actually want to experience on your vacation. And once we understand your passions, your personal eye takes care of the rest of the work for you, anonymously offering your trip for thousands of the world's best travel agents to make offers against. So instead of getting spammed by thousands of bad offers, your AI filters only those that match with what you actually want. So my AI is free for travelers to set up and use, but we charge travel agents a monthly tiered subscription fee based on the services we provide to make them more profitable. We also monetize transactions with the platform 
And in the case of travel, we charge a small commission on the final sale. So realizing this vision uh, is an eclectic and cross-functional team of seasoned startup and industry professionals and strategic advisors. Uh, we also have a variety of partnerships. We partner very hard. We were incubated by Cinder Ventures, a global startup incubator, and we're now preparing for our next external financing round. So our ask is 580,000 over the coming period, and this is to support AI implementation within the platform and extensive beta testing uh, with our current uh, co-development partners. And our idea is to launch a, a high fidelity uh, product in 2021. So stop wasting time planning, let other people do that for you and let them do it for free. Instead, come join us on our quest to give you back control of your personal currency. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, Robert. Judges, we would love to hear your feedback and questions. Maybe you can start. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on your um, AI tech behind the product? Yeah, sure. So from AI perspective, um, we're, we're working on natural language understanding for the human machine interaction from the demand side, which is the travelers. So this is an AI hard problem. So we're taking it sort of step by step uh, in this process. So first doing as much as we can with just really basic <laughs> machine learning and decision trees and, and everything we can accomplish that's low hanging uh, in order to elicit the requirements or the, the travel preferences, shall we say, for these customers in the beginning. But over time, we hope to really help solve that, that AI hard problem of the natural language understanding. So that's, that's a really big emphasis for us is, is that user experience on the front end side. So we wanna create a new experience. So what the current approach with our AI implementation in the travel sphere is they try to, when you enter into an online travel agency like booking.com or, or some of the others, uh, they use AI to look at your and profile you very quickly. So the clicks you do, uh, just a few clicks and maneuvers around the web page and they've already profiled you. And what they do is they, they push specific offers that they think you might want to put, uh, purchase on there. Our approach is very different. Our approach is actually understanding what your passions would be. And then in an, un, in an objective way, exposing that to travel agents for them to act creatively and actually propose offers against those requirements. So instead of pushing things we might, uh, you might actually purchase, not necessarily what you want, but what you, we think you're going to purchase. We're actually presenting you in an unbiased way for people to match really what your passions are. And the result of this is that people are going to be uh, surprised. So, for example, uh, no, no one maybe is, is thinking about taking a vacation in Alicante from London right now. But you might be pleasantly surprised by an itinerary from that region that allows you to experience the local culture, the local cuisine and uh, the local um, archaeological uh, scene there, the things that you're actually interested in experiencing online. Other aspects of machine learning um, and, and AI, um, we have a recommendations engine. So a big part of the platform is not only the interaction, but it's also the matching. Uh, so we don't match with actual offers, but we match with skills and capabilities of the human agents there. Um, so. As you can imagine, if you're a travel agent and you have thousands of potential uh, travel demands within the platform, it's gonna be very difficult for you to qualify those leads based upon your skills. So the matching algorithms are working towards the, the lead qualification for the agents. So that's, that's supervised and unsupervised. And in the future, uh, we're gonna be accessing different data repositories on, on the internet to do actual active search. That's, thank you. How is it to do all this without being the operating system of a mobile device, for example? Because obviously Apple and Google can do it very easily if they put kind of their money and mind into this, but uh, being kind of limited by all the kind of restrictions that exist in the uh, in the operating system and uh, uh, kind of how, how are we able to extract all this data? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Is it on the, are so you talking the, the, about the, on the edge? living on the computing on uh, the edge or what are you I, I, I kind of 
the problem is that the moment you start gathering some data, you find the boundaries of your access. So your Apple is going to limit apps even more very shortly. So kind of gathering all these data, even with the permission of the user, which will kind of create friction and cost you money, will take a while. And this is something that inherently only the operating system themselves can do. So how are we going to go around this and kind of build really robust data set to, to have good insights into people's desires and not just kind of snippets of it? Yeah, so it, it, I understand your question. It is actually a very good question. Um, so two things. For the training sets, we have access to different training sets. So there, there, there's, there's two different types. One is the inventory of products and services in this case, the travel agents' inventories. And we have access to a, a very large inventory through our partnerships. Like, I'm for so example, with global distribution uh, services like Amadeus. Mm -hmm. On the, the user side, of course, uh, it's different from the, the preference inference engines that are used on Google side because we actually have an interactive process with the customer. So we're not inferring the preference, we're actually qualifying and, and verifying what their actual preference is for that trip. So we, we actually, our data requirements there are, are much less than what Google mm -hmm. and, and others would require. Sorry your, for running over. Your time is up, Robert, now. Thank you, thank you for your Thanks, Robert. And thank you for the question, judges. Thank you. I'm happy oh. to carry this conversation offline. Uh, and thank you, judges, for your time. Uh, we have one more pitch from Daniel from Augnet. Thank you. OK. So yeah, some years ago, fortunate enough to join a what was then a very small company uh, called Skype. Uh, I stayed at Skype for over 10 years and uh, eventually uh, was managing the connectivity between Skype and all of the telecom companies around the world. Uh, this came with a, a fairly significant budget of about $260 million uh, and a, a small team. There's only uh, seven or eight of us uh, at peak time. And while I was doing that role, I experienced a fundamental flaw in, uh, in the industry, in the SMS industry specifically. So this is what led to the foundation of Orgnet. Uh, so my name is Dan. Uh, Orgnet is uh, a fairly young company, about two years old. And uh, we are SMS services to uh, businesses around the world. And quite often at this point, before people start switching off, around uh, well, why on earth would a young tech company be involved in SMS, such an old technology. And it's hardly been innovated at all over the last 30 years. And who uses SMS? Pretty much everyone. People forget about it. But if you look in your SMS inbox, you're now getting messages from your bank uh, for two-factor authentication, from apps, uh, any buying experiences you do online. So we're actually using SMS more and more. There's about a 7% year-on-year increase, and that 7% is set to accelerate as more people get mobile devices, as more of those mobile devices are smartphones, as more people get, um, get internet connectivity, less unbanked people. All of these macroeconomic things drive SMS traffic. And the fundamental flaw with SMS is when you send a message, it's in to validate if that message has been delivered or not. So imagine now you're a big company. You could take someone like Uber or Microsoft who both spend about $100 million a year on SMS connectivity. And imagine that you now have no insights on your SMS providers, no governance models. You can one supplier against the next. So this is what the does. Uh, we're founded, and uh, well, I'm the sole founder, but the, the founding team are these people we see here. Um, two of those people are individuals that I've worked with at Skype for a number of years. Uh, one of those people was the, uh, previously a CTO at Formula E, and before that had a uh, career with the MOD. And uh, we do also have some unicorn advisors. Uh, our CFO advisor uh, was the uh, CFO. Skype uh, originally uh, to eBay. Um, we've touched on the use of SMS, but just to delve into that a little bit more, it's trusted and ubiquitous. There is no other mode of communication that gets to every single mobile device on the planet. And it is more and more utilized by enterprises, particularly around sensitive information, such as uh, passwords, one-time passwords, and account notifications, 
uh, payment confirmations, receipts, and so on. Um, so SMS is here to stay. It's growing. The forecast for growth uh, is uh, still very, very strong. And fundamentally, when an enterprise pays for SMS, they pay for every SMS that they send. If it's delivered or not, that's irrelevant. So throughout this supply chain, there's constant leakages and errors and problems and uh, no visibility, no governance. And that is what Organet are solving. The red box here is the unique proprietary technology that we have. And uh, I can go into a little bit more detail about that uh, in the, oh, I've got about four seconds left. So uh, no worry, Veronica, I'll be wrapping up soon. But uh, yeah, this is proprietary, patented, uh, and uh, unique. Uh, in terms of traction, uh, we have already raised just over a million pounds as a uh, pre-seed. Uh, we've also won a half million pound UK Innovate grants. Uh, the product, although we're in beta launch at the moment, it is officially being launched tomorrow. And over the next six weeks, we are going live with um, a good handful of these customers you see here. Facebook is taking a little bit longer. Uh, Capita is, is scheduled for Q2. But uh, yeah, revenue traction, although we're sitting at zero revenue today, uh, we expect to exit this year with uh, just over £200,000 MRR. Um, that's me done. Uh, happy to take any questions. If there's no particular questions, um, I'll talk just for 30 seconds about uh, what is the proprietary technology. Uh, it's relatively simple. Uh, we have a, a simple uh, SDK uh, that we've managed to uh, distribute uh, crowdsource style. We're on about 2 million devices around the world. Uh, and um, what we're doing effectively is creating a sample size of data. So uh, a lot of you um, hopefully would have heard of a company called Twilio. They're probably the best known SMS company in the world. And um, yeah, we have a wholesale relationship with Twilio and about uh, 15 other competitors of theirs. So think of us as a marketplace for these SMS companies. What we do is we broadcast a load of messages through Twilio and a load of their competitors. And within about 20 seconds, uh, we have a sample size to see how they are all performing against each other. But just to stick with Twilio, they make about 12,000 supplier changes, routing adjustments every month. So just because you get good quality today through Twilio, it does not mean that at uh, 8 o'clock this evening in the UK, you're going to get the same quality. So we are continuously doing this real-time optimization, and that is our governance model that the likes of Microsoft are being attracted to. Um, I would add, we have, from one of those large companies, we have also had a, 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 a well, AccuHire uh, approach, is, is, is how they called it, uh, for us to, to acquire us and for us to build this as, as, a, as, as product people for them. Uh, obviously, we, we, we've deferred that. We're, we're backed by angels and a VC, where uh, we've got slightly bigger aspirations than, than that. And, and how do you foresee this growing and, and developing? Um, so, yeah, I think over the next two years, it's really a bit of a, a land grab for us, right. whereby most businesses who use SMS are familiar with SMS, but there is no change. There's no differentiation between any product. You can switch between Twilio and a competitor and not know any difference. Uh, with us, because we're being insight-led, uh, that's something that companies who care about quality and the yields they get per SMS, uh, governance is extremely important. So for us, it's really a bit of a land grab. We're, we're targeting the largest companies out there. Um, you know, every week uh, we're having two or three calls with household brands such as Uber, uh, Google, um, and you know, so on, so on, so on. Every, every week, it's a, you know, exciting discussion. So we're, we're targeting those, those big multi-million spend companies. Uh, ultimately, we're, it will be a trade exit. We, we we think we will be sold and actually targeting an exit with one of the big CPAS companies out there, such as Twilio. Interesting. Um, and and I guess then the my last question, and it's more an education point for me, is just, you know, how crucial is SMS in terms of? one customer retention or, you know, being able to uh, upsell a new product to someone? Yeah, so there's a bit of a, frankly, a bit of a bubble, I think, in the SMS space at the moment. Um, we don't talk about SMS anymore. We talk about a communications platform as a service. Right. 
So when you look at someone like Twilio, they offer a whole load of other services like WhatsApp for business uh, and email servicing and, and stuff like that. Uh, frankly, that, that stuff that um, is pretty simple to integrate. It, it's delivered by third parties. You need an API with them. So by uh, September this year, our product roadmap uh, will match what uh, Twilio has. So there, there's very little differentiation you can have between one CPaaS company and the other. Um, so yeah, upsell for us yeah, is to grab them as a um, as a, the only company in the world who offers a governed SMS service. We're the only company in the world who offers SLAs for SMS connectivity, um, and that that's really by you know by far the biggest spend that customers have. There's other things we can upsell, you know, uh, WhatsApp for business and other communication needs, uh, voice services, and so on. But uh, these are bolt on and. Um, yeah, their features rather than core products. Hey, Daniel, really interesting hearing about the problems with SMS deliverability. Um, could you talk a bit more about your traction to date? So maybe you know some of the customers you've worked with, as well as the revenue, perhaps that you've been making so far. Um, yeah, revenue is uh, start off with that one. So it's an easy one. It's pretty insignificant. Uh, we we did, did a soft launch of our service in January. Uh, it's probably you know, it's a few thousand dollars a, a, a pounds a month. It's not something we particularly track. Uh, this was really a sort of uh, get it out in the field and uh, make sure we can we can be transmitting these messages. We have interconnects with the likes of Vodafone and as I say Twilio and so on. So it's really just checking that that throughput of SMS works. We have discovered a few bugs, uh, all now fixed and uh, yeah, officially going going live tomorrow. April Fool's Day, probably not uh, not a very wise calendar choice on our side. But um, yeah, so product traction is is there. Uh, clearly, we've been working with customers in the background over the last nine months. And um, yeah, one of the sort of challenges we've got is that we have been targeting these, these very large companies with long sales cycle. What we want to do, actually what we're raising a uh, seed top-up round for at the moment, and, uh, and also what we'll be uh, doing a Series A round in, in September, October time, is really to um, engage with the smaller customers, which we'd want to do through a self-serve model. So come into our website, get an account, get in the API credentials from that website, and customers get themselves up and running. Uh, they're used to doing that through the likes of uh, their, their Twilio experience, so it's, it's not a new concept. Um, it just takes quite a bit of um, content to be generated behind that to support customers digitally through uh, through their integration. Uh, and of course, the market, you know, online marketing as well. We're very much a direct sales model at the moment. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was a great presentation. And that was the final presentation of the evening. So thank you to judges for being here tonight. And thank you to all the startups that pitched. Up next is the networking session. This is a great chance for judges and startups to catch up if they didn't have time earlier. And I hope to see you all there. So you can click the networking in the left column to build some relationships. And I hope the judges can stay for it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.